So again, Merry Christmas here. I'm also fighting a quite nasal congestion cold also. So it might sound a little nasally here. Please forgive me for that. Um, we will not be having Sunday school next Sunday. Thomas Road is having one service. I think it's at 10 a.m. And there's no child Sunday school, nothing. Everybody's going to be there in the main service. I guess they just assume nobody's going to be around. It's going to be a really small crowd. But we also have a Christmas Eve service here at Thomas Road, obviously Christmas Eve, at 3 o'clock or 5 o'clock, and they're identical services. So if you're in town, I really want to encourage you to come to one of these services there. All right. So we will be back together on Sunday, January 3rd, 2016. And we'll have some great New Year's sermon message lined up for that date. All right. Well, this is actually my first Christmas Sunday sermon ever. So I've been seeking the Lord quite a bit. Oh, oh another announcement. Snack sign-ups are going to be going around for the new year. So, so it's first uh, Christmas Sunday service sermon I've ever done before. So I was, as I was prepping and seeking the Lord, I wanted to do something kind of unique, but I knew it had to be obviously on the birth of Jesus because it's Christmas. So it felt led to focus and narrow into three areas today. We're going to focus on the importance of Bethlehem, the manger, and the angels and the shepherds out of Luke 2. And with this importance, we're going to see how God uses these things to fulfill prophecy and to bring about His will. So if you have your Bibles and you haven't already, start making your way over to chapter 2 of Luke. Normally, I you know, like to start with some kind of well, piffy story or historical narrative. But since we're talking about the birth of Jesus, there's no better story than actually reading from Scripture. So we'll be reading the birth narrative out of Luke chapter 2. Be reading straight through from verse 1 to verse 21. You can uh, follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Verse 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went, and with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he, Jesus, was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So to begin with, we're going to take a little look at Bethlehem. Bethlehem, at the time of Jesus, his birth was a small little city, maybe 300 to 1,000 full-time residents. Can never quite figure it out, but it was small. Joseph and Mary being there was miraculous for them to be there. We'll get into that in more detail. And we know the one born there will someday rule everything. 
Bethlehem, as you can see here on the map, is about five miles from Jerusalem. So it's relatively close to Jerusalem. And its full name is Bethlehem Ephrath, which means house of bread. So how fitting is it that the one born here, John says, is the bread of life. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> Joseph and Mary were both descendants of King David. So therefore, when this universal census came about, they were going to have to go to their ancestral hometown, which was Bethlehem. Well, at the time, they were living up in Nazareth. Nazareth is 70 or so miles straight shot down to Bethlehem. Now, if you remember your history a little bit, Jewish people did not like going through Samaria. They would actually take the long way around so they could avoid Samaria, which would have added a whole lot more walking. Now, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt, being that Mary was pregnant, that they took the straight shot down. But still, this is 70 miles, it's not paved, and it's very hilly and mountainous terrain. Go ahead. Well, we could start off walking to Charlottesville. Oh, there now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, all right. So as mom said, then when we all get out today, don't walk to your car. Walk on past, hop on the highway, and go up to Charlottesville by walking. That'll give you an idea. But at least we'd have a smooth road to go on. So this would be a particularly grueling journey for Mary. She's about ready to give birth. Riding on a donkey, bouncy, bumpy. Yeah. Um, and Bethlehem. They claim it's on a mountain, but I, I think it's a large hill. Bethlehem's at about 2,654 feet above sea level. But so as they're coming, just about to get to Bethlehem, they'd be coming over a ridge. And I could just imagine, they see this ridge here. There's Bethlehem up there. And it, you'd, it'd be terraced with vineyards and lots of sheep up there. And Joseph and Mary probably would have just been filled with this stream of like patriotic memories from their forefathers, give me a second Jim, because of Bethlehem. And they'd have some inspirations from their ancestry about what has transpired in little old Bethlehem and what is going to happen. I was just going to say 2,600 feet is not a small hill because that's where a lot of the Blue Ridge Mountains are. Yeah, but when you, some of us from the West Coast have 10,000 foot mountains. Okay. Yeah. But I'm just saying it's... I know. It's still, it's still a good bit. <laughs> Yes, yes, there you go, I'll be pregnant, yes, so, it, yeah, it's still somewhat of a challenge, it would, especially being pregnant on a donkey, so then, okay, question, yes, does it ever say that she was on a donkey, ever, no, 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 no. no. it doesn't say it, we assume it, I just don't see her walking 70 miles, no, I don't either, I don't, I don't either, like a cart or something, I don't see him having a chariot because they weren't rich. Because when Jesus is born, they have to do the lesser offering. Right. Yeah. But, um, do you think they traveled in the caravan or do you think it was just that? It's a possibility because everybody had to go to their ancestral homes. So there'd be, there's chances are that there'd be people traveling all over the place at this time to get wherever they're from, originally their ancestors. Yeah. The text never highlights this, but there were probably other members of the family, other yeah, Joseph had brothers, yeah. she had brothers, I had to talk. they all would have had to go down. He's on there with teach again. The text never goes into that detail. Yes. That's possible. Awesome. Yeah. So they weren't just the two of them, chances are, as the text yeah. is written in because it's a useless enough yeah. detail. So, Bethlehem is an ancient little town. We find it first in Genesis 35. And we're going back thousands of years before Jesus. Rachel died there while giving birth, named her son Ben and I, son of my sorrow. Again, then, how fitting is it Isaiah calls Jesus the man of sorrows? should mention, there's going to be quite a few references on my slides. If for some reason you can't mark them down for the note takers, I'll send you the slide. So don't worry about getting all these little references. Ruth, later, falls in love with Boaz there in Bethlehem. We know that King David's born there and shepherds there and is anointed there in Bethlehem. Now, when you see the city of David with a big C, big C means Jerusalem. Small C means Bethlehem. You have to know that because some you see city of David, you automatically assume Jerusalem. But here when it's talking about it, it means Bethlehem. Did I see a hand? Are you 
you said that David was born here was not on your slide. I was just asking. No, yeah. I, I can't put every single detail down. No, no, I was just <laughs> yeah. yeah. Born there, lived there, was anointed king there. Yes. And later in David's life, when he's fighting against the Philistines, he's kind of in a bad lot. He's dying of thirst. And he's just, I'm dying of thirst. Well, three of his mighty men kind of did like a little special forces incursion behind enemy lines into Bethlehem to a well, got him water, brought it back to him. And David goes, well, who am I? But these men risked their lives for me. I cannot drink this. And he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. There. But so, again, how fitting is it that the one who truly offers living water and can truly quench thirsty souls is to be born there? Yeah. Isn't this all fascinating so far? Yeah. Well, it's going to get better. Yeah. <laughs> all right, here's one of the main characters Caesar Gaius Augustus. They found this. Uh, head of him, by scout sculpture, excuse me, in Sudan. Yeah, it's not his real head. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. On my screen's high def, which actually uh, portrays a lot more details than the see there, but it, it's amazing how detailed that is of what we can, that's what he looked like, Caesar Augustus there. So have you ever thought what an amazing thing it was that God so ordained beforehand that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. It's out of Micah 5. And that when the time came, the Messiah's mother and legal father were living 70 miles away. They didn't have cars. It's a good walk. That God brought about a census to fulfill his word and bring just two ordinary little normal people to Bethlehem at the perfect time. So God put that in the heart of Caesar Augustus, that census, that the whole Roman world should be enrolled. Now, it needs to be noted out of Matthew's account, when the angel shows up to Joseph, it says, hey, Mary's pregnant. Joseph took her as his wife. That means he took her into his home. The marriage was not consummated till after Jesus was born. See, Back then, we know the betrothal was like legally being married. You had to get a divorce if you were going to break off the engagement. Nazareth had maybe 400 to 2,000 people at the time of Jesus. So it was also a small town. You can just imagine, all of a sudden Mary's starting to get a little bigger. The talk, the gossip that would have happened. Joseph was an honorable man. He was a God-fearer. He had the right to have her stoned. But instead, he listened to the angel, he listened to God. And so when he took her into his house, everybody in the town just assumed that they got married. And everything was on the up and up, and so that would have stopped the gossip, gossip at least for a little bit there. So, but they were technically still betrothed until they consummated the marriage after he was born. So, this, the Roman Empire did have censuses before Gaius. But they were every 14 years, there's a 14 year cycle. I know our U.S. census, you know, it's every 10 years we have the census here. But the previous census in the, censuses in the Roman Empire was for men. And the Jewish people were exempt from it because they were not in the army. So the censuses in the past were how big of an army can the Roman Empire conjure up if they need to. This new census was going to be universal. Wanted to number every person from every nation, every tribe, everywhere. And have them, men and women, go back to their home and get registered. This was, the statistics that came from this census show up later in Matthew 22 regarding a poll tax. And the Jews really hated this census and the tax because it's a sign of Roman oppression. There. So we see that, you know, the universal census was a miracle in its sense, in itself, that God put it on Caesar's heart, and how they re arrived down there to Bethlehem at the perfect time was definitely a miracle from the Lord. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I, I understand that uh, counting uh, Israel was, was different than two. Did this census fall in that 14 year cycle, or was it outside of that cycle? Um, I don't know. I couldn't find that. I, I, yeah. Uh, Were the women included in that census? This one, yes. Yeah. But the previous ones were just men for the army. 
Yes. Now, the, some of the provinces would have their own censuses. This was a universal entire Roman Empire wide. But the governors were allowed at their discretion if they wanted to have their own census for their own taxes, could do it. But this was much larger in scope. Surely. There's a bit of confusion from, um, from what I've heard about the census that people were not, they couldn't locate the census that about timing when, I mean, is there is there historical evidence that there is a census? Because that's, that's a debate that's going on, it's, from what I've heard. Okay. I'm not sure if that's I don't want to spend too much time on this. Okay, it talks about when Quinarius was governor. The Greek is vague. Quint the dating of Quinarius is later, no way Jesus could have been born there. But if you translate the Greek literally, it could mean before Quinarius was governor. That is the quick answer. Before, otherwise, it's going to take a long time to explain. But it's actually very explainable. It means before Quinarius was governor would be the proper Greek translation. Uh, I remember reading in Josh McDowell about this thing. He said there were two times when Quinarius was governor. That's, that's also a possibility, too. One is a military, one as an economic governor, too. Let's, let's, no, we're getting sidetracked. That's not the point this morning. Please. So the one born here will someday rule. That's out of Luke 1. Well, that sounds local because it says there'll be a ruler in Israel, right? Okay. To think of maybe another earthly king. But we know that in the kingdom, the Lord will rule the earth. This is after his second advent, the millennial kingdom, and eternity. This is a very neglected part of the Christmas story. Jesus will be sitting upon the throne of David, and when he comes back, then there will be peace on earth. Not until then. And so, you know, this is good news for us believers in regards to peace on earth, but it's not what the secular world wants when they say they want peace on earth, so they're not going to get their wishes and desires on that. And they've twisted it out and have left out peace on earth and goodwill to rich men whom God is well pleased gets dropped off a lot. So let's move to the manger. The manger perfectly pictures Jesus' rejection, first of all. Have you ever wondered why Jesus was laid in a manger? Why not a palace? Well, we know a manger is a feeding trough for animals. And that's where that whole story, backstory comes that Jesus was born in a stable, comes from because it was a trough. There's no evidence that Jesus was born literally in a stable. Ancient traditions say he was born in a cave. You could go to Bethlehem tomorrow and you could have a tour guide point to you and say, there's the cave. And they have all this gold inlay and the late like a uh, little like temple there that um, they yeah. claim Jesus was born in that cave. But there's no actual description ever given in the Bible of where Jesus you. was born at. But then, okay, why would there be no room in the inn for them? Easy. The census. Okay, we got a small town. Everybody's coming back. So, of course, the one, they'd probably have one inn there. It'd be packed. And everybody that lived there would already have had their extended family staying with them. So there will, really would be issues with room there. But you would think that if God so ruled the world that he caused this empire-wide census to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, he surely could have seen to have room available in the end. Right? Yes, he could have. And Jesus could have been born into a wealthy family. He could have turned stone into bread in the wilderness. He could have called 10,000 angels to his side in the garden of Gethsemane. Could have came down from that cross and saved himself. This is important. The question is not what God could do, but what God willed to do. God's will was that Christ was rich. He, for our sake, became poor. You know, that no vacancy sign above the N was for our sake. God rules over all things, even motel capacities for the sake of his children. So the Calvary Road begins with a no vacancy sign in Bethlehem and ends five miles away with the spitting and scoffing on the cross in Jerusalem. And regarding more to rejection, it's interesting, John's Gospel doesn't really have a birth narrative per se like Matthew here and Luke does, but John begins with that famous the word becomes flesh section there. And this is kind of interesting, talking about Jesus being rejected. So he's rejected there from being able to be in the end proper area, even though they're pregnant, they didn't want to make room for her. Well, John talks about how in John 1, the Word was God, 
The Word was the Creator. The world was made by the Word. The world knew Him not. His own received Him not. But we know Christ is the Word. And the world still rejecting Jesus to this day. And that's quite tragic. So the manger perfectly pictures his rejection, but it also pictures his redemption. There's two signs that are going to be given to the um, shepherds by the angels, or angel singular, when they come to see them in, in the uh, fields. First is that Jesus will be wrapped in swaddling cloths. Oh, okay, there's quite a few of you who have been mothers bef- and have given birth to children. When your little baby was born... Would you have ever considered immediately wrapping them in white cloth very tightly, almost like mummifying them? No. But they did that back then for two reasons, very interesting. First of all, when the baby is growing in uh, the um, mother's womb, what else is growing? Fingernails. They didn't have nail clippers back then. So when the baby was born, there was a chance that he or she could scratch the eyes and the face and be scarred and disfigured. Second, they believed that by wrapping the limbs straight, that the baby would have stronger bones. And some ancient, sorry, some uh, eastern uh, cultures still actually do this to this day. Maybe they think it'll strengthen their limbs. Kind of interesting. And then, Lying in a manger. It's saying the Lamb of God is going to be lying in a manger. John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God in John 1. Then we see the Lamb all throughout Revelation. He's uh, called a Savior, a warrior. We know about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, lambs are basically defenseless, so it's interesting that in Revelation that we see a warrior lamb. Back then, for, lambs were basically used for sacrifices and wool. But we know Jesus as the lamb here who will have more than that kind of purpose. And then, you know, it's not far from the manger to the cross. So, as we're celebrating Christmas and the birth of Jesus, let us not forget about his death on the cross. Paul ties it in in Galatians 4. Jesus came to redeem those that were under the law. Jesus' birth and was born for that. And in Philippians 2, Jesus emptied himself at his birth, even to his death on the cross. Well, from there, we move on to Jesus. His reachability is pictured at the manger. So the first announcement outside of the immediate family are two humble shepherds out in the fields. Okay, they're not local. They're kind of out there. Shows that God's willing to reach out to people. And he chose the manger instead of a palace, so he chose to be humble. And the gospel meets us where we are at, John 3.16 says, so it's for everybody throughout the world. And we know that Jesus receives all that the Father gives to him, and he will never cast us out. But we have to be careful never to restrict the gospel or complicate it. Mormons, witnesses, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, and so forth that are cults, they have twisted the gospel. They've either added or subtracted or totally changed it, and hence destroyed it and taken away the power from there. But we also can never discriminate and say, hey, we're going to go target these rich people or these poor people or whatever. We need to be willing to spread the gospel wherever to every ethnic peoples. doesn't matter. So, we see here how the Lord is working so far through the, like, in the purpose of the manger. Through, you know, it shows his rejection, his re- redemption, and Jesus' reachability, or we could say his availability to all people. With that, we are going to switch over to angels and shepherds. In Luke 2.13 it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host (laughs) praising God. This is the angel with the shepherds out there in the field. Host is a military term. It describes an army encampment. Uh, Jesus liked to use military terms to describe like angels in Matthew 26 when he's talking about being in the, gar- when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. So he could have brought all these legions of angels down to protect him. Uh, Revelation 5 suggests that the number of the angelic host is so large our human minds could not even fathom it. And note here, 
this heavenly army, heavenly host, is bringing a message of peace at this time, not war. So, here we have these, or before that, okay, so angels also appeared to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. We know Mary, we know Joseph. 400 years had transpired from Malachi to these events. There had not been a true prophet in Israel. God had been basically silent. Now some great miraculous things happened with the Maccabees and how Hanukkah has come up about and so forth that they didn't have a true prophet during that time. Well all of a sudden we're having angels appearing and talking to people. This, this is like, hey, something major is about to transpire. This is amazing here. And not only the Messiah, but John the Baptist, who had a great ministry too. So all of a sudden, the 400 years of silence are broken immediately. So, we have these shepherds here. Moving on to the shepherds. They're out there. They're doing their job. They're just watching over the sheep. And they're about five miles from Jerusalem. Why would they be so close to Jerusalem? The temple. What did the temple need? A constant supply of animals for sacrifices. By the time of Jesus' life, shepherds were terribly despised. And it's sad. But they were critical to Judaism. Um, they, the shepherds could not go into the temple courts. They were considered ceremonially or religiously unclean. They were looked down as at outcasts. A lot of them would be accused of stealing, like they're stealing other people's sheep, or uh, illegally using somebody's land to feed their sheep. So they were really despised. Which is quite sad because if you go all the way back to King David's time, he was a shepherd. Uh, shepherding was considered a family business. It was honorable. It was something worthy worthy to do as a profession. But not in the days of Jesus. Probably even used some of the same fields. Right? Oh yeah. I would think. Uh, yeah. For centuries it was done that way. It still is. So these little shepherds would be out there on the hills and it was prime grazing land around Bethlehem for sheep at that time. So they'd work 24-7, 365 days a year. They would not get any breaks there. Then also, I know the text doesn't say this, but I think, okay, the angels, or angels sorry, appeared to these shepherds. So it must have been a large flock because they had more than one shepherd. And so... I don't think they all would have left because the sheep would walk off, somebody could steal them, an animal could devour them. So I think one poor little guy probably had to stay behind. But we don't know. I wouldn't want to have been that guy if, if that's what happened. But okay, normally one flock of sheep would have one shepherd. So shepherding would be like a very lonely occupation, especially at night. You'd have to stay awake. Be, and you watch the sheep sleep. And all of a sudden, sheep number 12 over there wakes up and just starts walking off. <laughs> like, yeah, there you go. Yeah, just walks off. And you gotta go grab them. Um, then you also have to keep your eyes open for predators looking to devour them. The predators are like, oh, here's an easy meal. Sheep don't really fight back. They can't do anything. They can't even run fast. And then you would have... Um, you know, robbers could try to come in and steal your sheep and so forth and that. But also, shepherds had a tender side. They would take care of their sheep. They would count them. They would protect over them. They would put their life on the line. We know King what David did and so forth on that. And you know, a sheep was hurt, they'd pick them up, carry them back. Uh, when they migrated to a new area, they'd have to create a new pen for them. That took a lot of labor. So you know, God, of course we know God would visit those in such a lowly occupation and give them the privilege to witness Jesus' birth. Because it shows you on like Jesus' mission statement, he's come to those who are sick or lowly, not to those who think they have it all. Because they're more willing to accept the gospel. When I was little, my dad used to preach on the, the shepherd and said that the, for the little wandering sheep, you know, the one that always wandered yeah. off, all the time, what they would do, he said that the, the sheep, you know, they break the land. Yeah. yeah, their little legs would be like these are pinkies. And do a clean break on the leg of the lamb that was wandering and find it and put it in his, uh, in his 
clothes are in his robe and holy clothes and tell it that, you know, um, healed. And the sheep would get so used to the shepherd's voice and so close to it <laughs> that it would probably follow the shepherd closer than the other. Well, I can see that's a great story. Thank you for adding that. Yes. All right. So the message. So the angels appear. And the first word or out of the mouth, fear not. Now, most of the time when we see pictures or drawings or illustrations or stained glass murals of angels, they're blondes. It could be a blonde woman or a blonde man. <laughs> now, honestly, right now, if a supermodel blonde man or woman walked through that door with the first word out of their mouth, need to be fear not, why would we be afraid? There's more going on to that. Uh, <laughs> yes. It says here, and I don't know if the translation is correct, but it said it, I, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared <coughs> with the angels. Yes. What is the heavenly host? More angels. With the angels. There, there's one angel there, and then more angels appear singing praise. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, if blonde, I do not, blondes normally don't strike fear in people. So, they have, <laughs> now, <laughs> um, it does say in our text here that the glory of the Lord shone around them. That doesn't happen in all the accounts when angels show up, but almost every time an angel shows up, they say fear not first. So I'm thinking that they have some kind of like supernatural command presence or bearing upon them that strikes fear in people. I mean, you, you think about... What? They're, they're absolutely different. I mean, yeah. you just imagine, like, we're humans and we only know what we see. Yeah. And to see something out of our, what yeah. we're commonly, you know, to yeah. know, I think that's, they're just so different. But they have to look like humans. Yeah, they're much bigger. bigger. Well, but they have to look like humans because back in Sodom and Gomorrah, the evil town wanted to take them and thought they were men. So there, it has to be some resemblance to humans. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So, all right. With that, we don't need to go too far off on this. The point is fear, fear, fear has been with humans since the fall of humanity. Okay, we have fear stalked us throughout all the ages. Four quick examples: Abraham lied about Sarah. She's my sister, not my wife. Jacob's afraid of Esau. Moses was afraid of both the Pharaoh and being rejected by his own people. Israel is afraid to enter the promised land. That had some serious reper repercussions for those people there. But Jesus in his life dispelled fear everywhere he traveled. These are just a couple examples. There's lots and lots throughout the Gospels. We had the disciples on the boat. Jesus is sound asleep. They're freaked out. They're afraid they're going to die. Jesus calmed the storm. A blind people. Jesus healed quite a few blind people, like Bartimaeus. They would have fear that they would never see or never see again if they had lost their sight. What about leprosy? Terrible disease. You had to be isolated. You had to go to a leper colony to live and stay there until you got healed or died. Most were there until they died. Very few got healed. Uh, Jesus healed the ten lepers and this and that. Uh, not a lot of them wanted to come back and thank them, but whatever. Then Mary and Martha feared that they would never see Lazarus again. Well, Jesus healed Lazarus from the, de from the dead. So what we see here is a spectrum of fear. And then what would be the ultimate fear? Eternity separated from the Lord. But, because Jesus, our Savior, died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected and sent to heaven, he can dispel that fear and takes that fear from us. And taking away that fear, he displays that he is God. And he has authority over nature, any human ailment you, ailment you could think of, and ultimately death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus destroyed the last enemy and its sting, death. So, it will refresh you before we move into the next part of the message of the angels. God meets us where we are. He, reachability, availability. We have a Savior being born. Again, nearby in the city of David. This is what the angels were telling to the shepherds. All sufficient, Christ the Lord. A Savior for everyone. 
Shepherds, sinners, every single person. Now here's a little side note. This is fascinating. The word Savior is only found twice in the Gospels. That's it. Here in Luke and once in John. John 4. That's the Samaritan woman at the well. After she uh, accepts and realizes who Jesus is, she runs back to town and tells everybody. After a couple of days, Jesus is there with ministering to people. The men tell Jesus, these are Samaritan men, they go, you are the Savior of the world. And remember, Samaritans were despised people. They were considered outcasts by the Jews, and they recognized Jesus as the Savior. All right. All right, so their message. There's three parts to their message that the angels brought. First, a message of joy. Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now, if you don't have joy, there's a little concern about you and your life and your walk with the Lord. I'm not saying you need to be joyful every single moment of your life. That's impossible. But if you don't have more joy than not, there is a problem. And I'm not talking about happiness. Happiness is based on happenings. So if nothing's happening, you're not happy. So happiness is based on circumstances, life events. Joy is much deeper. And joy is not based on circumstances of life. Um, so, you know, we know a lot of Christmas songs are about joy. Joy to the world and so forth. Why joy? We need to be joyful because the Savior has been born. Scripture or prophecy is fulfilled. We know Christ is the Lord. And we can come to Him, have joy, and trust Him. Okay? Well, then what is really the secret to joy? You accept the Lord. Well, Paul states in Philippians 4, 10 through 13, listen to this. I rejoiced, Paul, in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Secret to joy is to trust the Lord, to love Him, and be content with what He's given you and what He has blessed you with. Um, as you all know, I've had leukemia. I have to go up to the cancer center quite regularly for checkups, for, uh, blood being withdrawn, and so forth. Just this last week, I had a phlebotomy. And you, know, you go up there, and most of the people are older. Sometimes I see people younger than me in middle age, but most of them are older. And occasionally, I'll bump into a fellow Christian. I've talked to some. Um, most of them are not believers, and most of them are bitter and angry at God in the world for their disease. And you can see it on their face. You can see it on how they act. I have seen people get physical there just last week. A gentleman, older man, was getting physical with his wife, trying to help her get uh, the wheelchair moved, and he was trying to fight and stand up, and is making a big scene, and it's like, wow. I mean, I just stopped and prayed for him in, internally there. I, I felt sorry for him. He had no joy. He had no peace. Freaked out that he has whatever kind of cancer he has. And I've seen a lot of that, similar circumstances like that over the years. But then you sometimes bump into a true believer, and they're there smiling. And they could be literally about to die, and they have that peace. So the Lord is with us. And you want to make sure that you have that peace in your life. Well, then they brought, the angels brought, a message of praise. Excuse me, glory to God in the highest. Now, the angels have been singing God's praise for maybe eternity, so it's nothing new. Job says they lifted their voices at creation. Uh, the universe declares his glory. They see it. The angels see it out of Psalms. But what's God's highest glory? when we come to know Him as Lord and Savior. Well, God's highest glory is He has declared provision and salvation, but then when we come to know Him as Lord and Savior. The heavens rejoice over every person coming to Christ out of Luke 15. I stop and think about that for a second. Every time someone throughout the world, there's maybe 7 billion people here, so somebody accepts the Lord, the angels and the Lord rejoice over that person. Wow. 
So God cares that much for each and every person in the world that there's rejoice and celebration over somebody coming to the Lord. After we accept the Lord, we need to grow in our daily walk with Him. That is also praising Him, progressive sanctification, growing in knowledge, growing in good deeds, growing in love. Uh, Ephesians 2.10, God created um, deeds beforehand. He prepared them for us that we're supposed to walk in them. So it's after salvation that brings honor and glory and praise to God after we accept Him. Then there is a message of peace. On earth, peace among those, key phrase here, with whom he is pleased. This is not a universal declaration of peace towards all humanity. Rather, John Piper says it like this, Peace with God is a corollary of justification among men with whom he is pleased. That sounds technical. I like MacArthur's version better. God's peace is a gracious gift to those who are the objects of his pleasure. So it's not peace on earth towards all men. It's peace on earth towards whom God is pleased. We know there's not been any true and real peace on earth since the fall, but because of Jesus, we can find peace with God. And we know without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So Christmas doesn't bring peace to all, never will. And it's a judgment. Jesus says in John 3 that... The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Or what about the aged Simeon later in Luke 2, when he saw Jesus, the child, he goes, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So how sad it is that many throughout the world or America look out on Christmas morning, We'll just assume they live somewhere where it's snowy because we're going to probably have a hot Christmas this year. But all they see is a bleak, chilly, cold morning. And they miss the true point and everything else. Very sad. So Jesus came to his own. His own didn't receive him. But as as many as do receive him, Jesus gives us power to become sons of God. And um, Jesus only told the disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So those of us who enjoy the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, are we who in everything by prayer and supplication let our requests be made known to God. That's the key to unlocking the treasure chest of God's peace is faith in the promises of God. That's why Paul prayed, May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing in Romans 15. So when we do trust the promises of God and have joy, peace, and love and praise God, then He is truly glorified. So we can have peace in any area of our life or every area of our life when we are trusting and walking with our Lord and Savior. Okay, mm, come on. All right, we got two more slides here. So, some final thoughts. Have you ever thought or felt like you're a little old Joseph or a little young Joseph and Mary? I don't mean little like in stature. I mean, just in this world of 7 billion people, I mean little as in like we're not rock stars, Hollywood stars, politicians, celebrities. We're just normal people. Well, um, you know, we don't have that power. We don't have that prestige that some do. Well, let's not get disheartened or unhappy about that. You know, it's implicit throughout Scripture that God guides all these mammoth political forces and economic powerhouses and the giant industrial complexes that without them ever even knowing it, they're being guided by God Not for their own sake, but for our sake. God's little people. The little Mary, the little Joseph. They had a timetable to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Without that census, there's no reason that they would have left Nazareth. God worked through the Roman Empire, mammoth forces, to get them to where God wants them to be, to fulfill His will. And when we go through... Adversity. Let's not think that the Lord's hand is slack or shortened because it's never our prosperity that God desires, but our holiness that He seeks. 
This is not some Joel Osteen, health, wealth, and whatever there. No. God wants us to be able to pay our bills, of course, but He wants our holiness, not prosperity. And uh, Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. So, our God is a big God for little people like you and I. And we have a great cause to rejoice in that. Because unbeknownst to them, all the presidents, kings, chancellors, emperors, whatever you want to call them, do have to follow the sovereign decrees of the Lord, whether they know it or not, so that you and I can be conformed to the image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. As we start to wrap up here, I like this out of Luke 2.19. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Now obviously that means originally the things that would happen with the birth narrative and so forth. But for us, let us treasure up the Lord for who He is, for what He has done in our lives, and what He's going to do in our lives. And so, treasure Jesus, treasure God, treasure the Holy Spirit, treasure His Word, treasure the church and your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And with all these treasures stored up, we must be able to rejoice this Christmas. So let us rejoice in God's sovereignty. The Lord was able to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. We discussed that many times. God provided a manger. That was His perfect will. God's grace. Jesus providing salvation as a gift through you know, atoning death on the cross, resurrection, and ascension. God's reachability or availability. Lord and Savior is our high priest. He intercedes for us. Uh, Jesus meets us where we are at. The Holy Spirit prompts us and so forth. And so, since Jesus has destroyed the sting of death, let us put aside our fears this holiday, whatever they may be. Let us embrace peace, which is shalom. In the Hebrew, it actually means wholeness. And it, in English, we have to use a lot of words to translate what shalom really means. It means completeness, soundness, peace, well-being, health, financial stability, and salvation. It is a state of being that is at peace and satisfied with God and fellow humans. So we are in harmony and mutual support with God and each other. That is what shalom means. And let's live a lifestyle of joy and constantly praise the Lord for what He has done and who He is. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, you see several times when Jesus appears in the 40 days of His appearing post-resurrection, He says shalom to them each yeah. time. Peace mm -hmm. be with you. Yes, He does. It was a common greeting, but I think it takes on an extra... After his oh yes, because then it could be complete and whole there. All right. So with that, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Again, we are not meeting next Sunday, but we will be back in two Sundays. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, see you in 2016, and let's close in a word of prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ability to come here together and study your word and see more about your birth and the miraculous events and your sovereignty and your providence and your grace and your availability, Lord. We pray to just continue that in our lives that we may bring you glory as you mold us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. For those of us who are fighting a little sickness, please heal us. Be with everyone who's traveling, Lord, and especially lift up Danny Lovely as uh, the little baby may be coming any day, Lord, and lift up all the other prayer requests. Uh, be with the prices there in Texas as they're getting ready for the wedding in a couple weeks for Emily, Lord. And just may we all have a blessed Christmas week here and keep our focus on the Son, Jesus Christ, which is the true reason for Christmas. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.